we just come into this place. Um, we come in as a, a family of believers um, to worship you this morning. We welcome you here. God, I pray that you would speak um, to our hearts, that you would speak through Drew, um, Brother Dabbs, as he brings the message this morning, and that it would not just um, fall into our ears, but it would penetrate us this morning, and, and um, that we would leave this place and change people. We just ask all these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Until you've actually been in a choir, you don't realize how significant it is for somebody to say. <laughs> We're reading responsibly from God's Word today, Deuteronomy 6. I'll read the regular print. Please respond in the, in the uh, dark print. Hear, O Israel. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away. When you lie down and when you rise, bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Let's speak of God's word. study 
of His Word and meditating upon the Scriptures. I believe in the power of the Word of God. And so today, as I preach in just a few moments, we'll talk about what to do with our Bibles. Uh, but we have asked this week uh, Mr. Carol Butch Putnam uh, to come. He is a member of the local Gideon's Camp. He's also the church ministry coordinator for the local Gideon's Camp and speaks in many churches. Uh, he's going to share with us about the Gideon ministry. Uh, they are a ministry, as you know, who believes in the power of God's Word. And so they want to make sure that we put a copy of God's Word into as many people's hands as we possibly can. And at the end of the service today, uh, he will be at one sanctuary exit. Uh, we will have another station at the other exit of the sanctuary. And we ask that you give to support this worthy ministry as the Lord leads you. As a young boy, Herb uh, was told many times that he would not live very long because he had severe heart problems. Uh, it, when he, uh, his heart would, his heart would race very, beat very uh, hard, and he had run out of breath. As, as he became a teenager, he had a lot of chest pain. Uh, Herb was working with a neighbor one day in the field when he was a teenager, and the neighbor suggested to him that he uh, should go to the Mayo Clinic and see if they could do anything for his heart. So Herb made an appointment uh, and drove to Rochester, Minnesota, not knowing his destiny, checked in the hotel and uh, went to his room and he pulled out the Gideon Bible like this one. And as you know, in the front are helps and needs of time of crisis. So he searched through there and he, the, he found the verse there, it was in John uh, 1.14, which says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Well, he <clears throat> thought about that a while, and he realized that not only did he have heart trouble, but he had a troubled heart. And he knew that God was the only solution. So right there in that hotel room, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And uh, <clears throat> he still couldn't understand why God made him the way he did. But he realized then that God <coughs> does everything for a purpose. And God does not make mistakes. A couple months later, he went and had his open heart surgery. And the four defects that he was born with were corrected. Uh, then nearly 45 years later, he had another open heart surgery and, and was successful. And again, once again, the Lord spread, uh, spared his life. Herb is forever grateful for having God speak to him that night in that hotel room through the Bible. And he appreciates the Gideons for making sure those words are there. And that's what we're about, the Gideons. We're there to place those Bibles and also to witness to people. But, you know, because we don't, we don't, you know, God speaks to people and touches their hearts and opens them up for you and I to witness to them. So we as Gideons take no credit that credit belongs to our Lord and Savior. Uh, <clears throat> the, the other thing that I would say about the Gideons is that you know, we're an association of business and professional men, and since 1899, our sole purpose is to win people to Jesus Christ through spreading His Word and witnessing. Also, uh, <clears throat> you know, we just, we're in uh, 201 countries, territories, and possessions around the world, and <clears throat> we distribute God's Word in 95 <coughs> different languages around the world. And, uh, excuse me, in more than 95 languages now, excuse me. But, uh, you know, uh, we place Bibles, as you know, and New Testaments in designated locations as motels and hotels, which I know most of you are familiar with. And <clears throat> we also uh, place Bibles in hospitals, in assisted living facilities, and through your ongoing contributions, we distribute New Testaments, like this one, to uh, colleges and students. That's one of my favorite things is distributing New Testaments to fifth graders every year 
And you get some of the most interesting questions about God when you do that. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the other thing that <clears throat> we also distribute uh, New Testaments to prisoners and prisons and jails, but also uh, to police, fire, and medical personnel, as well as our men and women in the military. Uh, as member of local churches, Gideons visit the churches to tell you what God's doing with the seeds that we're sowing. Again, we take no credit for that. Uh, we also, as members of local churches, work with believers like you to spread God, the gospel around the world. You know, one fact that I always find interesting is the Gideons distribute two scriptures every second of every day in the year. Isn't that amazing what God has allowed us to do? Uh, you know, by God's grace, uh, during the, this past year, we distributed over 87 million copies of God's Word. And again, by God's grace, in the last six years, we distributed over 85 million copies each year of God's Word by God's grace. You know, as it says in Isaiah 55, 11, and I'll use this verse because it's become one of my favorite verses, but so shall my word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I send it. And it's so true. Isaiah 55, 11 is fulfilled, and God's word does not return void. It's men, women, boys, and girls come to, to Christ through reading a scripture placed by Gideon. Uh, another, another testimony I'd like to share with you this morning is uh, the Gideons were doing a scripture distribution in a public school in Malaysia. The Gideons were excited to see one life touched by God's word. The student reluctantly accepted the New Testament from the Gideons and he had a lot of questions. Why were we there distributing Bibles? And the Gideons told him about the Gideons Worldwide Ministry and that, but it didn't seem to satisfy him. He wasn't satisfied with any of the answers, but there were a lot of other people waiting to receive their copy of God's Word. So he, he walked away, and when they had finished distributing, the young man walked back up, and the Gideon took the opportunity to, to, uh, to explain more to him, and the boy and the young man began to understand the Gideon told him that the, we, they distributed scriptures so people can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And he shared with them how we're all sinners, but we receive forgiveness and new life through Jesus Christ and accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The student prayed with Gideon and accepted Jesus as his Savior and received the answer to all his questions at that time. You know, <clears throat> We, we need your help uh, to continue to reach students, reach hotels, reach countries around the world, starting with prayer. You know, and I always say that with great emphasis. The best thing you can do for Gideons is to pray. You know, pray that we'll have the funds in the coming months to continue to meet the demand for God's Word. Uh, pray for us that, that more men and women would join the Gideons. Uh, uh, to help in, in spreading God's word and distributing God's word around the world. And finally, pray, and this is the most important, pray that those that receive God's word would not only open it, but open their hearts to Jesus Christ as they can read that Bible. Now, you know, if, if God's touched your heart this morning and about the impact of his word around the world, uh, Please consider making a financial donations to the Gideons International. You know, for an investment of a dollar and twenty cents, we can have this Bible delivered anywhere in the world and placed in someone's hand who's in need of it. And that includes all the cost of printing the Bible, mailing it, and delivering it to that person. And I think you would agree that's a pretty good deal in today's world. You know, um, one other thing that I would mention to you about God's Word is, is these Gideon cards. And you have some located in the church office.
there, and uh, the, my wife and I use these as a way to remember a loved one who's passed away, or there's cards there to just send to people, tell them that you're thinking about them and praying for them. And uh, by that, by doing that, you can you put the you can mail the card, fill it out their name and everything, and then send in the money of how many, ever many Bibles. These Bibles uh, from the Gideon card or the larger ones that we place in the hotel. And then think about it, think about it. The, a Bible like this in a hotel, the average life is six years, and it has the possibility, not all of them do, to reach 2,300 people. Isn't it amazing what God can do with that? Uh, so please consider that. And then also in your uh, the bulletin insert, there's more information on how to uh, do, to send in a card uh, through the online and also to a number, uh, 1-800 number to call if you want to do it uh, by phone. And then uh, there's a, uh, some other information about the Gideons and additional testimonies. And uh, if you want to send a donation at a later date, there's a, a address, an envelope that's addressed to the Gideons. And uh, Pastor, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and share about the Gideons International and that, you know, we feel that we're an extension of this church and the ministry of this church by spreading God's word. And I want to thank each of you for your attention and may God bless you.
offering our worship to you. Lord, as we have sung praises to your name, we have read your scriptures together in a spirit of reverence and worshipfulness, offering that back to you as, a, as an offering of worship. And now, Lord, we have come to this time in our service where, where we give back just a portion of the financial blessings you've graced us with, Lord. Lord, uh, we, we know that you are our provider and that you provide all that we need. So, Lord, we now give this back to you as an offering, an off, uh, act of worship, not only as uh, our offering in church, but our offering to you. Lord, thank you for these children that are here and for their leaders. Lord, we also give this to you as an offering of worship today. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
this time, at this time, for Children's Church, all those aged kindergarten and younger may make your way to this back corner of the sanctuary where your teachers will take you to your classroom. And I'll ask the rest of you to please turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. In just a few moments, we're going to read a couple of verses from Acts 17. Uh, what <clears throat> Mr. Putnam did not share with you uh, directly was he told, and I'm, I'm directly quoting him, was that uh, the Gideons were definitely in need of some uh, some new members uh, to help continue this this ministry of placing God's word in various places. I believe the exact phrase were that they were getting a little long in the tooth, <laughs> is what he told us preachers a few weeks ago, and that they would uh, they are always on the lookout for uh, new members who want to participate in what God is doing through the Gideon ministry uh, today. Acts chapter 17, again, is where we'll be in just a few moments. I'm also going to reference 2 Timothy chapter 3, though I will not ask you to turn there unless you just want to. I try to keep it to one place so that we don't have to split back and forth in our Bibles. Once upon a time, a young minister was interviewing with his first church. He'd never pastored a church before, and the people on the committee asked, Son, what we really want to know is... How well do you know the Bible? And he said, well, I, I know the Bible inside and out, frontwards, backwards, every which way. I know the Bible. And, and they asked him, well, son, what, what part would you say you know the best? He said, well, I mean, I know all of it. They said, well, you can't tell us all of it. How about you just tell us something from the New Testament? Just give us, tell you what, tell us the parable of the prodigal son. He said, okay, I can do that. He said, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus went down to Jericho by night and he fell upon stony ground and thorns choked him half to death. Gomorrah, uh, the next morning Solomon and his wife Gomorrah carried him down to the ark of Moses to take care of it. And as he was going through the eastern gate of the ark, he caught his hair in a limb and hung there 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards he was hungry and thirsty and the ravens came and fed him. The next day three wise men came and carried him down to the marina where he caught a ship to Nineveh. When he got there, he found Delilah sitting on the wall and he said to the men with her, chunk her down, boys. And they said, how many times shall we chunk her down? Seven? He said, nay, but 70 times seven. And they chunked her down 490 times and she did burst asunder in their midst. And when they picked up the fragments, there were 12 baskets full left over. And the question is, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? <laughs> They all shook their heads and said, he's awful young, but I think we ought to call him. He sure does know his Bible. <laughs> How well do you know the Bible? I've known people said, oh, I believe the Bible cover to cover, maps included. Though I really don't know a whole lot of it. How well do you know your Bible? And I would say that the answer to that question is in direct proportion to what we do with our Bibles. I heard about a minister, this is a true story, who went into someone's home to visit. Those people had a question for him, something about the scriptures. He said, well, folks, I hate to tell you this, but I left my Bible in my car. Can I just use yours? Can you hand me? They said, yeah, but preacher, you're going to have to get up off the couch. He said, for what? He said, well, you know, one of the legs broke off that thing about six months ago, and that Bible was just the right height to prop up that corner of the couch. That is not what we need to do with our Bibles. When the Apostle Paul got back from his first missionary journey, he spent some time in the city of Antioch and a little bit of time in Jerusalem, and then he and Barnabas parted ways. And Paul teamed up with a man named Silas to make another missionary journey. They left Jerusalem, and they picked up young Timothy in one of the first towns where they shared the gospel. And when they got to a place called Troas, Luke got on board with them, Paul and Silas spent a night in jail in Philippi before the four of them, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, made their way to a city called Thessalonica. Well, they weren't treated very well in Thessalonica, and after posting bail, they escaped to a city called Berea. And the people here in Berea, where Paul was located in Acts chapter 17, these Bereans give us a great example of what to do with the Bible Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy have just been released there in Thessalonica. And we pick up in Acts chapter 
17, verse 10. Follow along as we read. It says, As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and, here's the key phrase, examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And verse 12 says, as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek men and women and many Greek men. Notice again that phrase there in verse 11. They examined the Scriptures every day. Other translations say they searched the Scriptures daily. What a great example. What a great example for us to follow. That's something we can all aspire to, that we, that we spend time every day searching the Scriptures, examining the Scriptures, studying the Scriptures. But why? Is what I would always ask. Why? Why is it important that we do that? We hear people tell us all the time, we need to read our Bibles every day. We need to spend a little time in the Word every day. But, but, but why? Well, Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist, he said, I have never found a useful Christian who wasn't a student of the Bible. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? He was that way. I've never found a useful Christian who was not a student of the Bible. Our Bibles do us no good except maybe to prop up a couch if we don't open them up and read them and study them. Study God's Word. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, some of you may have turned there. Uh, <clears throat> Paul tells us that, that reading and studying Scripture is important, and that it's important for three reasons. First of all, he tells us that, that Scripture is important because it gives us the wisdom, the wisdom that we need to receive the salvation that comes by trusting Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to focus on that word wisdom. The scriptures give us wisdom, especially wisdom related to salvation found in Jesus. So it doesn't just give us the wisdom we need to initially enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, but to continue to develop that relationship with Jesus Christ. If you get anything, get wisdom, especially wisdom related to your relationship with with Jesus Christ. And we get that from reading and studying the Scriptures. <clears throat> the next reason Paul gives us for, for reading and studying our Scriptures and, and that being important is he says it is useful. It is profitable for four things. Well, actually, you can break them up into pairs. It's a little easier, I think, in my mind to understand it that way. Scripture is useful. It's profitable in showing us what to believe and how to behave. Belief and behavior go hand in hand. His exact words are there in chapter 3, verse 16, that Scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Teaching and reproof both have to do with what we believe. What we believe. Correction and training in righteousness have to do with, with how we behave. And so... If you look at it that way, but there's another way you can look at it also, that, that it's two sides of discipline. You know, there's positive discipline and there's negative discipline. There's the don't do this, and there's the do this instead. So that's another way to look at this. Reproof and correction are the negative side of discipline. They show us what's wrong with what we believe and how we behave. Then on the positive side of the coin is teaching and training in righteousness to show us what we should do in terms of belief and behavior. Reading and studying our scriptures is important because it gives us wisdom, especially wisdom related to developing our relationship with Jesus Christ. And because studying the scriptures teaches us what God wants us to believe and how God wants us to behave. The third reason he gives is that reading and studying Scripture prepares us for the good work that God has called us to do. Paul's exact words are, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Someone said, God didn't give us Scripture to gratify our curiosity. I like that. Instead, God gave us the Scriptures ultimately so that we could become 
mature believers. That's the first word there, complete, mature, who are well equipped. That's the second word there, thoroughly equipped. Complete, mature believers who are thoroughly equipped to do, it says, every good work. Whatever good work God calls us to do, which certainly includes sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Search the Scriptures, study the Scriptures, examine the Scriptures, because in the Scriptures we find wisdom, especially that wisdom related to our relationship with Jesus Christ, because the Scriptures show us what God wants us to believe and how God wants us to behave, and also because by studying the Scriptures we become equipped, thoroughly equipped, to do the good work that God calls us to do. There was a little book that was very popular for a long time. Don't see it around much anymore. It's called Haley's Bible Handbook. You heard of that? Lots of you have. Haley's Bible Handbook says this. It says, every Christian ought to be a Bible reader. It is the one habit which, if done in the right spirit, will make a Christian what he or she ought to be in every way. Every Christian ought to be a Bible reader. It's the one habit which, if done in the right spirit, will make a Christian what he or she ought to be in every way. So yes, reading and studying our scriptures is important because of the benefits we receive. But it's also important that as we read and study scripture, we have the right spirit about it. Uh, the song, Speak, O Lord, I don't remember which, uh, which stanza it was in, but, but it talks about giving us a holy reverence for the Word of God. That's one spirit with which we should read the Word of God. It's a spirit of reverence. The spirit of reverence. This is, not a, this is not like a dime novel you pick up at a used bookstore. It's not like a textbook or Chromebook these days that they give you in school. It, it's different than that. Everything in this book was inspired by God the Holy Spirit. Paul's words back in 2 Timothy 3 were that all Scripture is God-breathed. Two words, God-breathed. Everything in here from cover to cover is God-breathed, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. So as we study the Scriptures, do so with a spirit of reverence. But on the other hand, I would say, also, don't be afraid to ask questions when you read and study the Bible. You, it's okay to be inquisitive about the Scriptures. Be reverent, yes, but, but don't be afraid to ask questions. I assure you, your questions, our questions are not going to hurt the Bible. It's okay to ask questions. In fact, that's how we learn. We read something and go, well, I don't really understand that. And we start digging and we start asking it. And we dig deeper and deeper until we finally get to what it is that we need to understand. And we get to a point where we say, God, I don't understand this, but I trust you anyway. Many years ago, even before the King James Version of the Bible was translated into English in 1611, even before that, a man by the name of Miles Coverdale translated the Bible into English. And this is what he said in the preface to his English translation. Well, ever. 400 years ago. He said, It will greatly help you to understand Scripture if you note not only what is spoken and written, but of whom and to whom, with what words, at what time, where, to what intent, what, with what circumstances, considering all that goes before and all that follows. In other words, he was saying, ask questions. Don't just read and take it there for face value, but try to understand the context and who's writing it, who's receiving it, and everything about it. Ask questions. Be inquisitive. Those questions are not going to hurt the Scriptures. But those questions will help us understand the Scriptures. I believe there is a, a healthy balance to be found between this, this reverence on the one hand and this inquisitiveness on the other, which is to be found by approaching the Scriptures with a spirit of submission. Be reverent, but don't be afraid to ask questions. <laughs> ask questions, but don't forget that we don't stand over the Word of God. We stand under it. We stand in a place of submission to God's Word. A.W. Tozer said, I did not go through the book. The book went through me. That's what it's all about. We want this book to go all through us. And if, and if we read the book with a spirit of submission, it will go all through us. There's reverence as we approach the Scriptures. There's inquisitiveness as we approach the Scriptures. There's submission as we approach the Scriptures. And finally, as we approach the Scriptures to study the Scriptures and search the Scriptures, approach them with a spirit of anticipation. 
if we're not expecting to get something out of it, chances are we won't. Now, God may surprise you, but chances are, if you're not approaching the Scriptures with a spirit of anticipation, expecting God to speak through His Word, then chances are we're not going to get much out of it. When we sit down to study our Bibles, what are our, what are our expectations? Do we expect to be confused? Do we expect to learn? Do we expect God to speak? What do we expect when we sit down to read our Bibles? Soren Kierkegaard said, when you read God's Word, you must constantly be saying to yourself, it is talking to me and it is talking about me. When we read our Bibles, we can expect and we should expect God to speak through His Word. Remind yourself, when you read your Bible, it is talking to me and about me. Remember, the White L. Moody never found a useful Christian who wasn't a student of the Bible. Remember what Haley's Bible Handbook said, if we read and study our Bibles in the right spirit, it is the one practice that will make us what we ought to be in every way, which is what Paul says, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Search the Scriptures. Search them daily with a spirit of reverence, inquisitiveness, anticipation, Submission. That's what we need to do with the Bible. But very briefly, one last thing that we need to do with the Bible is live by it. Live by it. Live by the teachings of Scripture. Harry Emerson Fosdick said the world is equally amazed at two things. Anyone who denies the Bible and anyone who lives by the Bible. The world may be amazed at people who live by the teachings of God's Word. But God expects that from the followers of Jesus. The book of James says, don't just listen to what the Word says. Do what it says. Otherwise, you're just fooling yourself. That's what James says about reading the Scriptures. Jesus said, everyone who hears my words and puts them into practice. And puts them into practice. is like a wise person who built his house upon the rock. Now, if I can make a comparison, a calorie is a unit of energy. Calories are literally fuel for our bodies. What happens, I'm afraid to ask this question, what happens when a person takes in more calories than they burn off? Well, nothing for a few days. But what if that happens for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, a year? You know exactly what happens. You're looking at it. But here's the comparison. Listening to sermons, studying the Bible, it's like taking in calories. Spiritual calories. It gives us nourishment, fuel for our spiritual lives. When we keep on taking in spiritual calories, Without burning off spiritual calories, over enough time, we start to get a little bit <clears throat> spiritually lethargic. And from there, it's kind of a downward spiral because it's that much harder to become spiritually active. Because it's a lot more enjoyable most of the time to take in calories than it is to burn them off. I thought I'd get an amen for that one. <laughs> if you don't believe it, come to our potluck on the fifth Sunday of this month. We will show you that it is more fun to take in calories than it is to burn them off. But at some point, spiritually, we have to bite the bullet. And we have to say, you know what? Enough is enough. I refuse to be a spiritual glutton any longer. From now on, I'm not just going to listen to the Word. I'm going to do what it says. I'm going to live by the teachings of Scripture. And I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to do all, the, do all these things that Christ says that I should do. As we approach this time of commitment, I want to make the observation today that, that everyone here is in one of four situations. First, you're a believer who is studying the Word and you are living by the Word. You're taking in those spiritual calories and you're burning them off. You're serving the Lord. And I say to you, praise the Lord, keep up the good work. 
Second, you're a believer who is studying the Word. You're taking in those spiritual calories, but you're not burning off nearly as many spiritual calories as you're taking in. And maybe you've become spiritually lethargic, and if that's you, then today I encourage you to bite the bullet, say enough is enough, and make a commitment today. Not only to continue to take in spiritual nourishment, but also to engage in serving the Lord and living by the Word and burning off those spiritual calories. Number three, you're a believer who really isn't studying the Word. The only spiritual nutrition you receive is, is what you get here in this place on Sundays. I say, yes, that may be enough to sustain you until you come back next week and get your cup filled up, but it's not enough spiritual nourishment for you to be truly useful out there in the world serving the Lord throughout the week. I encourage you to bite the bullet today and say enough is enough and make a commitment to become a student of Scripture and to begin to search the Scriptures daily. Finally, maybe you're not a believer at all. And you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And you've never made that once and for all decision and commitment to trust and follow Jesus Christ. If you're in that situation, then I'm going to invite you to come. I'll be standing right here in front of this table. I'd love to talk with you and pray with you. I'd love to tell you how you can receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And so I invite you to come as we sing this last song. Maybe you have other decisions today. Maybe you're ready to become a member. First Baptist Church. That's something the Lord's laid on your heart. Whatever it is that the Lord is leading you to do, we encourage you to make those decisions and those commitments at this time as we all stand and sing, Be Thou My Vision.